Hi, friends. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about some butt stuff, and I don't mean the fun kind. I am talking about Crohn's disease. Uh, specifically, uh, my type of Crohn's disease, there are five types. Uh, my type is called complex paraanal Crohn's disease. Yay, lucky me. Um, but actually, I was surprised when I uh, got diagnosed back in March, um, and when I was doing some general research from January to March waiting on that diagnosis, um, how few videos there were that really talked about um, the type I have, and specifically Remicade. Um, there were a few videos and I appreciated them. I may link some of them in the description below so you can go to watch some of the ones I watched about Remicade, which were really helpful. But I'm gonna talk about my experience with Remicade, my experience with the surgeries that I had, uh, how I got from point A to diagnosis and on, um, so that hopefully other people can use the information to help empower themselves to have a better experience uh, through healthcare here in the United States. Um, and what they can do to avoid some of the pitfalls I hit along the way. So context, this video is gonna be just an overview of um, from the point I got sick and my flare began to where I am now in the treatment process and kind of the overview of everything from beginning to end. So um, first of all, uh, I first originally got sick back in September. Uh, in September of 2019, I was working on my book, so sitting eight to 10 hours a day, a lot of sitting, um, and I developed some pain in my derriere that I thought was nothing, thought it was a hemorrhoid. Went and got some topical creams, as you do, and I think some tux pads or something, um, thinking, well, I just got a hemorrhoid, been sitting too much, you know, makes sense. Treated it for about two weeks, it didn't go away. And I thought, well, that's weird. So about the third week, now we're into mid-October, um, suddenly I have a temperature spike, and I mean like 102, 103 degree temperature spike. Um, chills, uh, achy bones, basically everything that comes along with the flu without the nausea. Um, and it was weird, because I was like, I don't have any, I haven't been, I've been out of the house in a couple of months. Um, and I'm having a lot of pain in my rear end. By this time, I'm taking the max dose of Tylenol and ibuprofen allowed per day. Um, and was waking up in pain. You know, I, I would not sleep more than five hours at a time at night, for example, before I'd wake up in sweats and in terrible pain. So I was gonna tough it out because that's what I do. But thankfully, my husband is the son of a nurse. So he insisted that I go to the doctor. Went to my family doctor, who is amazing. He was not available, so I saw the nurse practitioner who looked me over and said, yeah, kind of looks like a hemorrhoid. Um, I think maybe you also have a rash from some drainage from the, the bleeding of that. Um, you know, let's get you on an over-the-counter cream to fix the rash. Um, and some antibiotics to treat the infection because clearly you have a fever and so you, you, you have an infection um, that we need to take care of and um, we'll just watch it and let us know if in 10 days when you finish the antibiotic treatment if um, you're not feeling any better. So I think cool, awesome sauce. Um, I then went and headed home, took the meds, followed the rules, did everything the way I was supposed to do it. Fever did go down finished the antibiotic, probably two days after I was done with that, we are now into the end of October. And um, again, fever spikes, not huge, 100, 101, um, but the pain was astronomical. Um, also, I, this is, you know, again, this is gonna be a graphic video, but it is for people to understand what was going on. So if it's happening to them, they know they're not alone. But I was having a lot of drainage. So I had been using gauze padding to kind of collect the moisture that was collecting back there. And I was having to change that padding three, four times a day. So a lot of drainage. Um, and I again thought, well, it's just the antibiotic has worked its course and it's pushing that infection out. But the pain was just more than I could bear. So I called my, my family doctor. Um, side note, he is a gay man. I do recommend that gay men have a family doctor, a family practitioner that is gay themselves. Um, guys, for whatever reason, are weird talking about our butts, and that's just stupid because there's lots of butt stuff like IBS and Crohn's and colitis that can be a real, real problem if you're not open enough with your doctor to say, this is unusual. 
Um, so anyway, he's a gay man. I was very comfortable talking with him about like, hey, this is not normal and this is not something that should be happening to me based on anything in my environment or my sex life. So he was like, okay, we're gonna need to send you to a specialist. So he sent me to a surgeon that does specifically um, intestinal uh, and anal uh, surgeries um, here in St. Louis at Barnes Jewish, uh, which is a hospital here in the St. Louis area. Um, went to see her, amazing Dr. Smith, love her. I will put links to my doctors below um, if anyone wants to read any of their work. All of them work at a research hospital, Barnes Jewish, affiliated with Washington University, which is a top med school in the country. So I was very fortunate to have the best and the brightest at my disposal. Um, I went to see Dr. Smith. I asked uh, what, what this was. She looked me over, did a scope, which was super duper uncomfortable. Um, but basically, I get on a table, get bent forward, and they put a little tube up there while I'm not under any anesthesia, just wide awake. And I had a bunch of people in the room, not my family or my peeps, but like doctors who were learning, and it was super uncomfortable, but get over yourself. So she looks me over and says, I think you have a fistula, an anal fistula. And I am thinking, what did I do in a past life to earn this crap? Um, and she explains it to me. It's basically a tunnel of infection. There's an infection in your intestines that burrows a tunnel to the surface outside of your anus, just around it. And it starts to leak uh, fluid infection, basically. Um, and they have to go in and fix it. So I said, what does that look like? So she says, well, you had a couple options. Once we get in there, we'll know more. We're gonna put you under and do what's called an exam under anesthesia. Um, part of that was uh, two options basically for how she'd treat it. One, a fistulotomy, uh, or another that was placing a seton. A seton is a fancy word for drain. Essentially, it's a little tubing that they use to tie a, a, a loop um, that allows it to drain better so that hopefully it will heal on its own as all of the fluid that's in there kind of drains out. Um, uh, she did tell me that the, the, the best option would be the fistulotomy because it's one and done. They go in and kind of cut the canal open. It's then allowed to drain and heal and you're kind of one and done. Um, she gave me the risks with that, which there are some because they're cutting through your sphincter, which for those of you that don't know, that's the muscle that holds in your poo. So, um, it was there it's not a surgery without risk right but i knew i was in good hands and when she asked me you know you're going to be under what do you want me to do if i have the option of the fistulotomy or the seton what do you what do you want so i said i trust you completely i have a good vibe with you whatever you think is best is what i'm going to do so we proceeded. I should note that from the time I was referred to her at the last week of October, it was the middle of December before I actually was able to get in to see her because they are that backed up. Um, and the pain was incredible. Again, I was lucky that my family doctor um, was willing to prescribe me some pain medication that allowed me to at least sit because I, when I say I was in pain, could not drive a car, could not sit at all, even with a donut and like all the, uh, you know, uh, stuff that pillows, whatever, nothing could not sit at all, had to lay down on my side at all times. At night, if I rolled over, even to roll on my bottom was beyond painful. I'd jump out of bed with stabbing pains. So pain like I've never experienced. Um, so anyway, finally get in to see her December 16th for this consultation and schedule the surgery for January 10th, which uh, was the first available appointment. I was absolutely taking the first thing they had because I was like, this has to stop. I can't, I'm losing my mind. I, I'm terribly sick and this is the hell that I didn't even know existed. So January 10th rolls around, we roll in for surgery and uh, have a great conversation with her before she asks me again, you know the risks of doing a fistulotomy. Do you still want me to go that route if it's an option? And I am like, yes, ma'am. Put me under, I wake up several hours later. Uh, my wonderful husband and my sister are sitting there um, ready to hear what the doc did, what happened, etc. She comes in and says, well, we did a partial fistulotomy. I was afraid to do the whole thing because when I got close to your sphincter, we were gonna be cutting a lot through it and I didn't want you to lose incontinence at this age in your life. I'm in my late 30s, even though I look to be 20 something. Um, just kidding, obviously, I know, but whatever. Uh, so she said, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing it because I didn't want you to have incontinence at this point in your life, you're too young. So I ended up doing a partial fistulotomy and a seton. 
Um, the good news is I didn't see anything in there that would make me believe that you have Crohn's disease. Um, she had asked me about family history. I have a cousin who has Crohn's. I also have another cousin in the same family who has IBS and there's all kinds of issues uh, with IBS in on that side of my family. So we were kind of expecting her to, to come out and give us some bad news on Crohn's. However, uh, my colonoscopy had come back clean. That I had done the week before the surgery, by the way. Um, and everything she saw while she was in there said, this is fine, this isn't a big deal. It just looks to be a one-off fistula. They happen. Um, we don't know why they happen, but they do. And you're gonna have this seton. We're gonna let it work, it work its course. So three, four, five months, we'll see if all of it's drained out. You'll come back and see me and we'll see if you're a candidate to have it removed. Skirt. I was like, I'm gonna need you to slow down. You mean this could be in here forever? Now at this point, I should say, the pain had stopped from being a constant throbbing already. Laying on the table after surgery was already better. However, I could feel a little something new hanging out back there called my seton drain. And it was not exactly enjoyable. So I thought, boy, I hope this is not forever. So she says, it's not forever. We're gonna be able to get it out. You don't have Crohn's, so that means you're probably a candidate to have it taken out. Uh, it would be very unlikely that you wouldn't be, so I'm gonna send you home to heal. She sends me home to heal. I stay at my sister's for a number of weeks. My husband was thankfully off work for a couple of weeks, able to help me. Um, I did need a lot of help because I was in a lot of pain and keeping that area clean so there's no infection is tricky, tricky. Plus learning how to just use the bathroom with the drain is tricky. So I'll save that for another video. Anyway, for those of you who have hung on this long, um, we get to February. The pain comes back with a vengeance. Uh, I can no longer sit. I cannot drive a car. Um, I feel the, the same pain, if not worse than I had before. And I'm thinking, I do not know what's going on with my body. Why, why, why? So I go back to see Dr. Smith and I'm in there going, help me, help me, what's going on? She puts me on her table, leans me forward. We've got a room full of people who doesn't love an audience. And she tells me, I don't believe it. I think you have another fistula. Um, she said, I'm not for sure. We're gonna have to do another uh, exam under anesthesia and I'll schedule it right away um, just to see if we can figure out what's going on. You know, this does tell me though, if it's a fistula, I'm gonna send you to a GI doctor because I think you're gonna have an IBS disorder that this is the precursor for. So I'm like, okay, if it's another fistula, are we talking about another drain or what are we talking about? She told me, she goes, probably another drain, um, but we won't know until we get in there, which is half the fun of this disease. It's like, oh goody, we get to do anesthesia to, again to find out what's going on with my bum. Sends me home, we schedule a surgery for two weeks later, I check in, uh, I wake up from surgery um, that time, and she comes in right away and she says, it was a second fistula. I couldn't believe it, but we dropped the hydrogen peroxide in, which is what they do to determine whether there's an infection there or not. And sure enough, the tunnel bubbled up, which told her it's another fistula, and it's on the opposite side of where the first one was. So if my bum is a clock, one was at noon and one was at six. Um, and she said, I, I couldn't do a fistulotomy. We did another um, seton because a fistulotomy wouldn't work uh, if you have Crohn's, and I'm pretty sure that's what you have. So then I'm like, okay, what's my next step? She's like, I'm gonna get you in to see a GI specialist. This was the second week of February. She's like, go home, heal. It's gonna take a couple weeks to heal um, and get in to see the GI doc and, and we'll go from there. So I call them right away. They get me in in the first week of March. Um, I go to see my GI doc uh, for my first appointment and he goes over my, my medical history and everything. He's like, I'm looking at your last colonoscopy. I'm not seeing anything that tells me it's Crohn's based on inflammation down there. Um, you know, you're actually not uh, losing weight. Like I, I had maintained my weight, which is another big like warning sign for Crohn's disease. And I didn't have that. So that seemed to be the biggest thing that most of the doctors were saying, well, you haven't lost a bunch of weight, so I'm not sure that's what it is. Thankfully, he took some blood from me and did a full blood workup and come to find out I had all kinds of vitamin deficiencies, 
which uh, even though I was eating pretty well, I'd been doing a food diary for them since January, um, they could see that I shouldn't have had those kinds of vitamin deficiencies. So uh, long story short, he checked out my blood work, called me back and said, um, you know, based on uh, your, your vitamin deficiencies, I want you to come in and do one more colonoscopy with me. I'm gonna look just at the outer area of where your fistulas are. I think you might have what's called complex paraanal Crohn's, uh, which is a really rare form, of course. Um, but I think that's what this might be. And I, I really can't diagnose you until I get you in to be seen because at this point I'm still having pain again and now I'm panicked. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have a third one of these fistulas. And at some point I'm just gonna be a, a bunch of drains back there, which did not sound enjoyable. So I go in for the colonoscopy probably the second week of March of 2020. So that moved, the GI part moved really quickly. Um, got me in for the colonoscopy and within two days he called me back and said, you have complex perianal Crohn's disease. So uh, I'm gonna order Remicade for you as an infusion. So you'll go to an infusion center, they'll put Remicade in and do a drip and uh, you're gonna do some loading doses. So that's gonna be one dose, two weeks later, another dose, two weeks after that, another dose, and then a two month wait to the next dose. Um, I'm also gonna put you on some immunosuppressants um, that will try to tamp down your immune system so it stops uh, panicking and creating these fistulas, basically. And I'm like, hey, let's do that. Uh, okay, so real quick, uh, I'm gonna go into a deep dive on the insurance and the Remicade in another video because although I have amazing health insurance, my health insurance company sure did deny my Remicade and tried to put me through a six month bit of hell trying every other cheaper medication and treatment known to man before I get to the one that there were many published studies said was the only thing that worked on paraanal Crohn's. However, my doctor, Dr. Deepak, who is a GI doc here at WashU, again, um, Barnes Jewish here in St. Louis, um, went, was, is a warrior. He went to, to battle for me with my insurance company, backed up with studies and all kinds of data and all of my test results to say, oh, hell no, and thankfully got me on the Remicade. Uh, my first treatment was um, the second week of April, I think, or third week of April. So really, really quickly. Um, you know, he got me in there and, and truly, truly fought for me. I mean, I had my insurance company calling me, uh, trying to get me on a recorded line to say things so that they could deny me. You know, he really helped me uh, be prepared and know what I was dealing with so that I could get the treatment that I needed. And again, that process with my insurance company has been so awful that I'm gonna do a whole video about it. So you guys can know what my doctor did so that if the same thing happens to you and your doctor isn't in the position that mine was in to have a full research hospital at his disposal studies and all kinds of things that he could throw at the insurance company, uh, that'll be a video in the future, so look for that. Uh, okay, so I start the immunosuppressants. Um, don't notice a lot of difference in the pain. Thankfully, again, my doctor had kept, my family doctor had kept me on a pain med um, so that I was able to manage it because I was no longer able to take ibuprofen because folks with Crohn's should not take it. It makes our flares worse. So Tylenol was not cutting it at that point. Um, basically, I was in incredible pain. Um, until that first dose of Remicade. And then it was like the magical nectar that just changed my world. From the very first dose, uh, probably, so th again, I will do a whole video about just the Remicade infusions, but for an overview purpose, from the first dose, within a week, I was feeling better. Within two weeks, by the time I was going in for that next dose, I, the pain was gone. I no longer had pain, I could sit down. Um, I could drive a car. Uh, I wasn't on the, the powerful pain meds anymore. I was just taking Tylenol and weaning myself off of that even. So that was truly, truly incredible. Flash forward to now where I have gotten out of my loading period. Today is June 30th. So um, I have an infusion in two days on Thursday and uh, the pain is back. So my doctor is currently fighting with my insurance company again. Do you see a theme? Uh, to get me on a monthly infusion uh, of Remicade. 
Uh, it is incredibly expensive. Uh, again, I intend to go into a deep dive on the insurance and how much it costs and share with you all of that process so you can get a feel for what that's like if you're going through this. But essentially, my doctor is currently going to battle with my insurance company to get me on a monthly dose so that I'm not where I am now, which is I'm in pain, it's not as bad as it was, but I am back on the max dose of Tylenol every day and I do wake up with pain uh, having only gone two months since that last Remicade dose. Um, so that's where we are. Complex paraanal Crohn's, yay, go me. Uh, anyway, so this is a general overview of that process. Uh, I'm gonna give lots of information in the description below for resources to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Um, I'll specifically list my doctors, not necessarily that they can help you wherever you are in the country, but, but they are research um, doctors and professors at medical school, at a very prominent medical school, so they both have published studies um, on this. So if you're interested in reading any of their published work, I just thought I'd link them below um, and also give them credit because truly, um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Deepak um, at Barnes Jewish uh, WashU physicians saved my life, uh, as well as my, my family doctor, Dr. David Perletsky um, at Southampton Healthcare here in St. Louis. They have been amazing, and um, if for nothing more, I'm gonna give them some credit in the description below just so you can check them out. Uh, and definitely if you're in the St. Louis area, especially if you're a gay male, check out Dr. Perletsky for his practice. Um, here in St. Louis. He, he's great. And again, my other two doctors are amazing. I can't say enough good about them. Whew, boy, it's a lot. It's a lot of butt stuff. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I will be sure to answer them. Um, if you're going through this or you have a family member that's going through Crohn's or thinks they might have Crohn's, um, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and a little and ding the bell next to it and you'll get notifications anytime I put up a new video. Um, I, like I said, this has been a real journey for me and there are lots of different aspects that I want to talk about and dive into in more in depth. So uh, I am going to, I have several videos planned uh, about everything from the insurance to the specifically the surgeries, to the cetons, to the treatment, uh, Remicade, the azathioprine, which is my immunosuppressant. Um, the side effects from those, uh, as well as things I've done in my diet and exercise to kind of make it better. Um, so please look forward to those. If you're interested and want to stay connected with these videos um, and all the talk about the butt stuff, go ahead and click subscribe below and go ahead and ring the bell. You'll get a notification every time I post a new video. Thank you for your time and have a good day.